Can you hear me? Uh, I will wait for a, yeah. Yeah. a couple of minutes. Looks like a lot of people are joining. Um, so we- uh, Hello, it's Florence Hudson. Hi, Florence, how are you? Good, how are you? All right, so I'm going to wait for one more minute and I'll start off with the usual, uh, you know, the uh, antitrust policy and the code of conduct, which Excellent. we are required. Right yeah, uh, after that, you can uh, say, you know, you can uh, request participation in your uh, group. Thank you. A few minutes and after that, we go straight to Kim, who has a beautiful um, presentation ready. Um, normally we go through introductions, but I think today we are going to be slightly pressed for time. So we'll uh, go straight into this uh, presentation after, uh, after uh, Florence's uh, request for participation. So the first thing to do is to say that as part of the hyperledger community, we have to respect the antitrust policy, which means that we are not involved in antitrust activities, namely price fixing or any other thing that might uh, interfere with the antitrust or with which does not meet the antitrust policy guidelines. You can see more from uh, looking at the agenda and going to the link there. The second item is the code of conduct, which means that the hyperledger community welcomes everybody. There is no restriction except that you follow the uh, antitrust policy and you are civil to each other when, even when you're disagreeing with them. Uh, this is in direct contrast to stuff that is happening around the world and here in the United States in particular. So we need to be kind to each other. That is the first, uh, that is the code of conduct. So we have 15 participants, which is a great thing. I see people who are, uh, who have not been around for a bit uh, back in here, like people like Brian. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Florence to do her pitch and then we quickly move over to Kim. Uh, I'll do a sh very short introduction to Kim. That's it. And uh, Florence, could you please uh, tell us about your project and why we should participate? Excellent. Yes, thank you. And let me try to put my headset on see if this is still working. Hello, can you still hear me? Yes. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Because I'm, I'm in somebody else's office. I'm trying to do it. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, Vipin and everybody, uh, for having us join you. My name is Florence Hudson, and I've been keeping track of a lot of the hyperledger uh, community work going on, identity, security, privacy, healthcare. Um, but I'm leading an IEEE effort. Um, so that's been keeping me very busy, and I want us to work more together. Um, so I lead a working group for IEEE called uh, Clinical Internet of Things, Data and Device Interoperability with TIPS. And TIPS is a framework, uh, the letters are T-I-P-P-S-S, -S, and it stands for Trust, Identity, Privacy, Protection, Safety, and Security. And also on the phone with us today is Mitch Parker, who's one of the vice chairs for the working group. And he's the CISO at Indiana University Health. Mitch, you want to say hi? <laughs> Let me and, take myself um, off mute. Afternoon, there everyone. you are. We hear you. And so Mitch is here. And William Harding might be joining as well. Uh, William. I'm, a, I'm actually here, uh, Florence, already. Thank you, William. You're wonderful. So William is the other vice chair, and he actually is from Medtronic, which, as you know, is a very important device manufacturer in the healthcare industry, and he leads the technical fellow program there. So we're delighted 
to have both of them as our vice chairs. And then um, our uh, secretary is, um, is Ganesh Jaya Ramakrishnan, um, who is from United Healthcare. And we have uh, 230 humans from 22 countries and six continents in this working group. And it's quite a range of people. We have industry, um, you know, the ones we talked about, we have FDA, NIH, NCI, we have a professor from Brunei, we have people from Africa, all over the planet. One of the things though, as we're going into the trust and identity space that we've identified, and I worked a lot with trust and identity in uh, academia, you know, within Common and Trust and Identity and IAM and OAuth and all these things, is we don't have a lot of identity experts in our working group yet. And so what I was hoping is that some of the uh, participants in the Hyperledger Identity Group would like to participate in the IEEE working group. The great news is VIP, and we already had two or three who joined, <laughs> who sent us information, uh, Ramesh and a couple of other people, and um, they do, you know, um, DID and uh, sovereign, self-sovereign identity. And those are the things some of the things we have to be thinking about at the technical level, because we're looking to create standards. And these will be global standards, and we want to do it all together, working with Hyperledger and other organizations, ISO and IEC, maybe UL. And um, this is a great opportunity for us to learn from each other and think about what type of global standards do we need in this space. You know, we, we, have a, we have a number of subgroups in the standard. We have a trust and identity subgroup. We have a privacy subgroup. You know, talk, and these groups talk about technology and policy. You know, so GDPR, CCPA, all these different things. Um, we have a protection and safety subgroup, security. We have a use cases and scenarios subgroup. And we have an intelligent systems designed with AI and ML. So we're really trying to have a very rich view and then we have to bring it all together to figure out what the standard recommendations are. And I would love for us to be doing this together. So thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to join you today. Uh, questions or comments? Or William or Mitch, you wanna add anything? No, I think you, this is William, I think you covered it very succinctly. And, uh, and like Florence said, we appreciate partnering with you all and hopefully um, some of you can join some of our subgroups and the working group. I I will agree with you, Florence. Incredible job. And also, again, we can't emphasize enough the value of participation. I'm on a couple of other IEEE working groups, and we heavily value all the work P2733 is doing in the other groups as well. And that's our project number for the clinical IoT, uh, data and device interoperability with TIPS. Yeah, Any other I have a um, uh, link uh, with a page set up already for that. Uh, so if anybody, yeah, I was going to ask if you could. I was going to ask if this is Brian. I was going to ask if you could put the link to the IEEE working group page yeah. in the chat. That would help for us to uh, contact you as well. Um, it is in you know from the um, from our agenda, which is sent out. Uh, you can go to the agenda, and there is a link there. Unfortunately, we have to hurry things along because. Kim has been patiently waiting, and I want him to have the maximum amount of time. And obviously, you can ask any questions to uh, Florence on email. And uh, Kim will make the presentation. He is the identity master. He was the uh, identity architect in Microsoft for many years, and he wrote the laws of identity and he is uh, still active, very active in the uh, in the uh, in the sphere, and uh, he has an excellent presentation for us. And without uh, waiting around too much, let's go straight to him. And if anybody else uh, is got the phone on, please mute uh, the phone because uh, we are hearing some background noises. So Kim, I can see your uh, I can see your presentation. Okay, great. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm, I'm a big uh, admirer of uh, the work being done by Hyperledger around identity, and uh, it's uh, I'd like to actually participate in this group more regularly. So. Uh, 
it, it's uh, I'm very happy to be here and, and, and to meet everybody. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a bit about sort of my, my background, just so, so people, a lot of you may not know about it. Um, you know, I, I've been working in the identity sphere since the, the 1980s, and I'm an expert on everything that one shouldn't do, um, everything that has gone wrong and everything else. So um, uh, I'd like to be able to share this with you. Um, and uh, I started actually on this project of, of sharing it in, in, back in 2004 when I wrote The Laws of Identity. So that, that basically came out of many, many errors, in, including a big one by Microsoft, where Microsoft tried to set up this, um, this, this project called uh, Passport that set itself up as sort of the identity hub for the world, where all of the world's identity information would very conveniently be located in Redmond, uh, Washington. Um, and so it, it was a thing that I, I had sold my company to, to Microsoft and I got there only to find out that they were moving in this direction. And it sort of became a bet noir for me. Um, and uh, out of that, uh, and, and, and it, it actually attracted a lot of, uh, of, of criticism from the rest of the industry, rightly so. Um, and I tried to teach others at Microsoft about why that was happening. And, and, and then I saw other people doing exactly the same thing. And I, I see them doing the same sorts of things to this day. You know, when you look at Facebook's uh, attempts to become a uh, identity hub, Amazon and so on. So um, the laws of identity started to try and analyze sort of systematically what, what was, what was uh, necessary in order to create an identity system that people would buy into and therefore would be able to um, sustain itself over a long period of time. So I won't go into uh, what was done there, but um, you have the URL um, and I would hope that uh, people would, would look at that because a lot of what was written, even though it was written in 2004, uh, is totally, uh, applicable today and and I think is is an important uh, thing for us to bear in mind when we're when we're building the um, the, the new generation of identity stuff that is coming along um, <clears throat> so I've retired from Microsoft uh, what I'm trying to do is to continue trying to help turn the internet right side up I believe it's upside down because it's basically been um, formed by the enterprises and governments and large entities who can afford all of the technology and, and, and so on. And, um, and they um, ba basically have devised things to meet their needs. And in, in so doing, it meets a lot of the needs of the ordinary person, but it also misses a lot of those needs. And, and really, we have to imagine the internet being um, turned around so that uh, the needs of the individuals are central to it. And uh, individuals are able to control um, their, their, their data, their, their, be able to have applications that can reason across their data rather than having their data stuck in walled gardens where, where they can't get at it and all those kinds of things. And in particular, internet identity is, 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 a, is a problem. And I'll be talking about that uh, in, in my presentation today. And then f finally, you know, um, given my stage in, in my career, I, I, I think one of the things I can do, because I do know a lot of people who are in the um, identity profession, and um, I, I would like to, to help those people understand what is being innovated and help the innovators understand what the opportunities of working with the, the, the people who are currently running these systems can be and uh, how it really is a, you know, a, it's not a zero sum game. Everybody can benefit by, by integrating these things. So um, that, that's kind of my agenda, my personal agenda is, is you know, so that the people innovating don't make the same mistakes that have already been made before and 
learn how to uh, get their stuff adopted. So I'm, what I'm going to do is, I, I, I've been trying to work with the with the identity professional community um, to change the big picture of their thinking. And so I'm going to share with you one of my uh, the, some of the ideas I presented at the most recent uh, uh, presentation. And it's um, you know I began with the question, well, okay, what have we actually achieved as identity professionals? And I think it's it's important for people who are um, working on the space in sort of an alternative view uh, to understand actually what has been achieved because it, it is it is considerable. Um, you know, enterprises have been going through it. It's such a cliche, but it's so, it's so true and real, um, this whole digital transformation. And people have created the, uh, have uh, identity systems at the, uh, that, that, that hold all of the technology and the enterprises together and actually do satisfy many, many of the requirements of uh, digital transformation from the point of view of the enterprise. Uh, we, we've streamlined and professionalized technology, all the technology for distinguishing between users. I mean, it, it began as just a, a horrible, horrifying hodgepodge and, and leaking and, and insecure and everything else. And we've been able to, 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 to really change a lot of that. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, in a great, it's been a great improvement. It involved a lot of work by a lot of people. Um, we've transitioned the world from raw authentication to this concept of exchanges of claims. Um, the whole idea of claims originated in the uh, laws of identity. Before that, we called everything attributes. And, and it betrayed the fact that in the pre-internet world, you had little, little fiefdoms where you had some kind of a system that was godlike. And, and knew exactly what people were. Whereas when we got into the internet, where you have a whole bunch of different actors, um, there is no uh, ultimate source of truth. Everything is really just being uh, claimed by some party about some other party. And that create, if you don't understand that basic starting point, you, 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 can't, uh, you, you, you can't solve any of the, of the problems that arise once the fiefdoms dissolve and you're in the current situation that we're in. Um, they have enabled, we have enabled a reliable identity dial tone for these big services and, and everything else. And, and now there's interoperability between a lot of systems. Um, we've increased the security of the internet over what it has. It's still tr tremendously in need of, of the kinds of things that are being worked on in the Hyperledger group, the whole decentralized whole decentralization of the internet has yet to happen. Um, but there has been a lot of progress made. So I, I sort of go through this and I, I say, I, I, I reassure uh, the, the people uh, who, who I'm talking to that, yeah, you, you, you've done a lot. You've done a lot that's important. But what have you done? How have you failed? And, and here I, I think the center is that the industry has failed to recognize that the digital transformation of enterprises causes the digital transformation of individuals. But we haven't recognized or responded to the, to the new needs that all of this creates in people. And what happens is that, uh, you know, people now have to, as, as all of the uh, enterprises and, and, and parties in, in offering services become digital. Each individual has to deal with an ever increasing number of digital relationships. And they have this new problem of scale. It's not like they had two or three of them one day, you know, at one time. I mean, now they'll have, well, people estimate that many have, have thousands of, of such relationships. They need to deal with the intensity, the change of intensity. In other words, the immersiveness of all of this, the fact that you're using devices all the time. And so identity becomes more and more, of, uh, the friction in identity becomes more and more disturbing. And that we have multiple devices now. And so the whole uh, uh, approach that we've taken of binding um, your identity information to single devices, you know, run by some, some uh, manufacturer, 
you know, is, is, really, uh, is really not adequate to the needs of people in, 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 in this period of personal digital transformation, where they, they're going to use multiple devices um, that are suitable to the different environments that, are, that they're in. And the, there's been a change in the need for technological longevity. You know, uh, we, we, we're going to have to change and up, upgrade devices over time. We're going to have to have to be able to change service providers as they wane and ebb and as we get fed up with them. We have to accommodate aging, um, memory loss, the problems of what happens when you die, what happens to your digital environment. So this whole problem of, of longevity, this is all part of this digital transformation uh, at the personal level. And why have we failed to respond? Well, I think the main reason, uh, nobody in, in the in the world of, of people working for enterprises think, ha, has, has been very conscious of it because it's all so gradual. This, this increase in the number of relationships, all of this sort of stuff is very, very gradual. And, and it isn't really, it isn't something that is on the front burner because it isn't a crisis in the short term. It's a crisis because of the way that it, it continues to add and, and turns from a quantitative thing to a qualitative thing. Um, in fact, uh, people themselves aren't, haven't been conscious of all of, of all of these problems. But once again, they their changes in perception happen very uh, qualitatively. You know, as for example, you can see from the changes of perception that people have had around social networks and things like that. And and if one day people's uh, memories start to fall apart. Uh, which, which is actually a fairly common uh, uh, occurrence amongst the elderly, um, then all of the systems that we have that depend on memory are just really uh, totally inadequate and, and people are disenfranchised and unable to, to handle uh, the world they live in. So um, we've been oblivious to the impending disjuncture. So my, my theory is that the gradual change of, changes of personal digital transformation will eventually make and are making the current systems unsustainable. Uh, but the people in the organizations uh, uh, and, and the organizational management and so on don't have a clue about it. I mean, it, it's, it really depends on people who are working in the sphere of identity to perceive these dynamics, sound the warning bell, and adjust co course. So, so I'm, I guess part of what I'm trying to say is that only those of us who are working deeply in this stuff can take leadership and we only we can recognize and address these emergent realities um, so you know we've, we've gone through the same thing around privacy you know if, uh, if 10 years ago everybody would say oh privacy is dead get over it um, all of the industry leaders were, were going on about it that way. And it was absolutely maddening for those of us who thought privacy was a, a characteristic of human, of, of human nature, if you wish. Um, but having ignored it, it just became a bigger and bigger underlying uh, unseen problem, sort of like an iceberg. Um, and, you know, and so then you end up with uh, the kind of activity like the uh, GDPR, where, where all kinds of systems have to be undone and redone. And it costs, costs many billions of dollars to try and adjust to something that we should have been doing from the beginning. Um, and we're really in the same way, uh, in the same situation, having, um, having uh, not recognized that the personal digital transformation is absolutely key and, and it's caused by the enterprise uh, transformation. So I, my, my, my theory goes on to say that, well, this PDT requires us to actually transpose human identity that evolved in the physical world into the digital realm. You know, in the physical world, people have been handling identity perfectly at the unconscious level. Um, but there's been no mean, no attempt really to, to replicate those abilities in the digital world. Instead, the, the digital services just solve their own problems. The enterprise solves its problems. The government sol sol solves its problems. 
um, not the problems of the people using their systems. Um, and so um, I guess my, 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 my thinking is led in inevitably to the fact that systems that, that we've been creating cause the problems that the personal digital transformation brings to the forefront. So if you want to do this transposing of, of what, what is natural about human identity, uh, how, how, it's worthwhile looking at how it was done in other, other digital realms. And um, I, th I think we can agree that, well, first of all, there, there was a deep understanding of the phenomenon and that led to innovation and, and innovation made it possible to do transposing. And so you end up with a holistic digital equivalent. So for example, if you look at digital music, uh, digital, uh, you know, digital audio, scientists had a very deep understanding of sound as waves. There's no ands, ifs, or buts about it. The innovation was, oh yeah, we can sample those waves at, 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 at periodically and figure out the amplitude, amplitude, and therefore we can turn that into a set of digits re representing the, at the amplitude. And we've now got a digital representation of sound, um, a holistic digital equivalent, because it it's, doesn't just transpose one sound, it transposes all possible sounds. Um, and that makes possible, once you have that, that nailed, the, this amazing phenomenon that we have where, where you now, now have hundreds of millions of songs and music of all kind available in digital form. Um, and you can look also, uh, anything you look at, uh, let's look at, say, the banking system or casinos, you know, whatever. People, there are people, uh, it's not scientists in this case, but it's people with a deep understanding of the phenomenon. And uh, they understand how a bank works or a casino works. And so, therefore, they're able to innovate and transpose and create the digital equ equivalent. But in the area of, of identity, who really has or had especially amongst uh, technical people, a deep understanding of the identity phenomenon. And, and if you don't have the understanding of the phenomenon, then you can't innovate uh, to, 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 to actually transpose it in a holistic way. You're, you're just sort of being very uh, pragmatic and, and, and re responding to short-term needs in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that is just, yeah, very short term. Uh, that's what's that's what's been going on in the world of identity. So I, I looked around for a long time. Who has actually got a deep understanding of identity? And you know, except for for understanding the problems of identity uh, amongst the uh, government systems and so on you really won't find uh, scientists or psychologists who have anything crisp to say uh, about identity as opposed to identification. Um, and not only that, you have a lot of people who are, who are just sort of making things up. Um, and my view has become, well, that, that's actually pretty problematic because uh, we all make up different things and we call it the same thing. And so we, we create a tower of Babel around the word identity and all of its concepts. And so um, I've come to believe that we really should use the actual meanings of the words rather than simply making them up. And so if you want to look at the meanings of world, words, you know, dictionaries are, are, are certainly a helpful tool. <laughs> the Oxford English Dictionary is, is the tool of tools when it comes to language, uh, for English language. Um, I'm trying to learn more about uh, the equivalents in other languages. Um, but it provides a very comprehensive resource. It's used by scholars. And the thing about it is it shows not only the current meaning of the words, but the way they've been used over time. And so you can really get a sense for how how ancient some of these concepts are um and so you you know i suggest you you people should should look at the uh, oed's definition of identity I, i'll be publishing publishing a paper where i will get permission to reprint it but if i take their 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 cons the, you know the, their definitions and, and these are actual just quotes from from the definition um i i ended up 
realizing there are really two aspects to it. One is what I, what I call selfness, and one is who-ness. And I've told you, I've just said, I don't think you should think up words and just make them up like that. But you know what? Um, selfness uh, comes from 1574 and who-ness comes from 1611. In other words, people have been thinking about these things for a very long time. And so by selfness, we're talking about the sameness of a person or a thing at all times. In, in other words, you're, you're, you're not you know, the fact that you're in different environments or doing different things doesn't change the essence of, of you as a self. It's the condition of being a single individual. It's the fact that you, you are yourself and not something else. And it is your individuality and personality. All the things that uh, the OED defines as aspects of identity can be grouped into the, into the self. Or, uh, all of those things, are, or I group them into the self, and all the other things it defines, I group, I group into the who. Who or what a person or thing is, a distinct impression of a single person, or a thing presented to or perceived by others, a set of characteristics or a description that distinguishes a person or thing from others. So we all, we all um, de deal with identity as 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 uh, as who-ness, um, and you know if you if you if if you want to uh, look at it sort of graphically, you have the aggregate of all the attributes and experiences that a person has through their life. That is what constitutes the self. The self is aware of all of those things. And in different contexts, they expose specific aspects about themselves to other people. And those are, those are it's not the same. No, no other has a knowledge of the entirety of the self. They only see what is revealed in specific interactions. And so if you put this together, you can imagine there's the self with its aggregate, and then there are the who -nesses. and I just made some up, uh, friends from school, colleagues at work, online store, social network, government. In other words, just each of those knows a specific slice about the, the self. And the, the definition of privacy in this, in, this, in this paradigm is the very fact that only what is contextually relevant um, is revealed in a who knows, and nobody has any knowledge of the of the entirety of the self, except except the self. Um, and if you if if uh, if if you have followed the discussion about profiling, which which of course is a hugely bothersome area, um, profiling is the uh, is the attempt by others to develop. A, uh, you know, a, to project or, or assemble an aggregate of attributes to represent the selfness as opposed to just the individual properties are, that are being dealt with by the who. Okay, so if we have that as a model, how, do that, how does that map to the current digital identity technology? Well, digital identity identification, I, I really think that what we've got to date is just digital identification rather than digital identity. And if I would change anything in the laws of identity, it would be, I would use the word, I would be talking about digital identification as opposed to digital identity, because I, I didn't really deal with the wholeness of, of the situation. It, was, it wasn't holistic enough. Um, but the, the you know and that and that was that reflects the fact that I was working you know in the industry you know for enterprises, um, but the uh, we we've become very good at representing who-ness you know and and so you know a lot of the systems that we have are, have, have done something about that um, you know governments can rep you know in many countries have gov government identity systems and uh, schools know about their students and at work you work in a everybody can recognize you in stores and so on but none of this 
has there's and there's been no technology for the self no technology to handle the problems of the aggregate so what in order to 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 move to a solution to pdt we need a whole bunch of new construction in the selfness and at the same time in order to to handle that problem of of privacy that that is so essential to selfness we need to make the the systems for whoness we need to really retrofit them give them a major renovation so that they're compatible with selfness with this new construction so the self needs its own technology and we need services and associated applications enabling the self to remember and manage their relationships and all the things that, that we've been talking about here. And digital who-ness must evolve to embrace selfness. So, you know, current digital who-ness is a set of claims issued by an observer, but it conflates the claims with the mechanism for recognition. So the observer assigns identif identifiers, secrets and keys, you know, like the company that you're visiting or whatever. Um, and it creates these problems of scale and intensity. So the new technology for the self allows it to create the identifiers and the keys. And this is to me the, the essence of a decentralized identity. Um, it isn't that it determines the way people are per per perceived or it determines all aspects of, of the who-ness, but is able to de determine um, the identifiers and keys through which it's recognized. Um, so the claims that constitute who-ness can then be provided to the self and the self can be in control of presenting them, solving the problems of privacy e.g. What are, what are called verifiable credentials and other similar titles. So we have these precursors of digital identity, who-ness, you know, um, that, that is, and that needs to be refactored at two levels. One is uh, sort of the level of characteristics, expression of what the characteristics are, and one is at the expression, uh, at the level of the recognition and digital impression. Um, and if you think about it, things like the OIC, o, o, you know, uh, OpenID uh, Connect, their, their idea of aggregated and digital claims are, are, are a very prevalent and, and widely adopted mechanism for transferring characteristics. Um, and we have a new technology called verified uh, credentials, which um, uh, add cer certain capabilities to those, although OIDC is adding them as, uh, as well in, in a somewhat simpler fashion. Um, and then at the level of recognition and, and distinct impression, uh, we have DIDs. We have Open IDs, uh, Open Open ID Connects, uh, SIOP, self-issued uh, provider, and we have FIDO2. Although FIDO2 is is fundamentally broken because there there the the enterprise again assigns the key to the individual, which is locked up inside the individual's device and therefore not available to the self meaning that it's it's per device it's 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 it imprisons the the user in a device um so when i say that um to re to really be to be con con you know uh, part of this of this holistic digital identity di uh, fido2 has to has to be transformed in order to to recognize the needs of the self DIDs and uh, OpenID uh, connects SIOP. That those are the new recognition technologies um, that are consistent with the needs of the self. Um, and uh, those are also uh, technologies which are capable of uh, allowing the user through through things like wallets and through you know all of the things that you guys are developing around uh, agents 
allow the, these uh, things to be brought under user control. In the selfness arena, though, I mean, we're, we're just at, it's just act, act, actually pretty pathetic. There's so little. I mean, we see these things called authenticators, and um, those are, you know, those represent a step forward and show that the notion actually has legs because they are adopted um, in the sense that they allow the user to have representations of multiple different relationships. Um, but they're still so primitive, and uh, the notion of wallets are, are, are well, once again, uh, very skewed to the paradigm, the the uh, the payment paradigm, and, and and just in need of of a tremendous amount of uh, of evolution. And then at the level of that of services, we have you know the diff hub and the hyperledger uh, agents. And th you know those are very those are very promising, especially as uh, all of that becomes more unified and 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 so on. So anyway, I'm going to conclude and, and leave it open to discussion. Um, but my conclusion is that a bullet train is headed straight for us in the form of personal uh, digital transformation, and we need to see it coming and get out of its way by evolving to holistic digital identity. In other words. That the enterprise, and, and uh, I guess what I'm saying here, and the reason I'm putting it this way, it's, it's kind of weird because I'm telling you about the messages that I, I've been trying to convey to the existing uh, identity uh, world, um, the pre uh, decentralized world, and trying to explain to them that the PDT is really. It's leading to a, uh, an uns unsustainable situation so that they can look at it and understand that, um, that these decentralized technologies um, actually are very important for increasing both the security and, and, and the usability of the, of the uh, network that, that are the response to this. Um, I also think that o OIDC, and I know this is like kind of uh, unusual um, in the world that you, you live in, but I think OIDC is it, it, it's very, very widely deployed information technology. That it can be triaged to determine how it fits into holistic digital identity. It's the one that is most triageable. And in fact, even in its current specification, it has a whole discussion on the self-issued OpenID provider, which is really the uh, it, that's a that's a misnomer because it's 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 self-issued keys, but it, it's able to pick up and convey as, uh, assertions um, made by uh, attribute providers, and in fact that whole technology has has evolved very nicely to separate. Um, um, the the ID provider or the key provider from the uh, claim provider, and here um, I should I should say um, it, it it to me it's a, a sort of a Trojan horse. It, it's it's kind of oh, so many enterprises have developed mechanisms for inter interacting with it that um, I believe it can, it can be used the SOIP system can be used as a way to get uh, the, the, the decentralized identities quickly integrated into existing enterprises uh, and to get enterprises to, to um, not be worried, oh gee, this is all an unknown technology. We can, we can, we can make it appear to be a technology that they've already deployed, this, this OpenID Connect. It's just got a few tweaks because it comes from individuals making up the keys, but it still gives them claims and blah, blah, blah. It's, uh, it's an interesting way to look at it. Um, I also conclude that SSI and DID, OIDC, SIOP, FIDO should be rethought by all of us in it, in these different parts of it, so that they fit together to solve the problems of personal digital transformation. Otherwise, they're just going to make things worse, wasting everyone's time and money, because the user will be 
if they have all of these things being deployed simultaneously, it will be absolute, absolute nightmare for them. Um, and the, the, it's, it's essential for us to predict that nightmare and to avoid it. And finally, uh, that we need to keep focused on the big questions raised by PDT and ask ourselves how the existing infrastructure can be incrementally transformed to the new world. Because you can't, the, the, the weight of the existing infrastructure is so vast. Um, we need to find uh, you know, how to penetrate it and, 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 and transform it incrementally uh, as opposed to trying to build some other thing parallel to it, which in my view is just a, a, a castle in the sand. So that's basically it. Um, there's a lot of detailed thought needed here. I'd love to be part of that conversation. Um, I would urge anybody who has thoughts about this to get in touch with me and I'd, I'd like to get to know, know you all. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kim. If uh, people have questions, they should ask it. Uh, I have a question, um, or rather a couple of comments. One is the selfness versus wholeness uh, seems to hark back to the philosophical uh, you know, duality theory. Uh, in the sense of the self and the world, but uh, you made a statement that the self is aware of things that the who is, uh, you know, the, the, the attributes that are exposed or collected by the who, you know, the, the people from the outside, the institutions, the, uh, the various uh, things from the outside, but in a sense, uh, since the self is uh, sort of disintermediated uh, from the past by, or, or kind of disconnected from the past by memory, which is an imperfect thing, um, you know, we have mnemonic devices, various other things. This who, uh, you know, people in the, in the who, not people, but institutions, uh, applications in the who realm, uh, often have much more detailed information about some narrow part of your world. Like for example, your cell phone uh, sends out uh, signals to the cell tower, which is connect collected and and it you know is per perfect memory. So for that narrow sector, that particular uh, segment has so much more information about you than. I myself, I, I may not remember like five years ago, where was I on this day? But if you ask the cell tower, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you look at the cell tower records, they probably will, will know exactly where you were. So there is the, that asymmetry of power between these two. Um, and um, how do we reconcile that in, uh, uh, you know, in creating this uh, self-controlled, device how do we get access and control of that that vast trove of information that is uh, actually stored by others and is not accessible to the self yeah I, I agree with you hundred percent and um, the I wasn't implying uh, <laughs> you know when you're interacting with others they they um, they're able to record their memory of the interaction just like you are. And as you say, their, their ability to uh, remember if, if, they're, if they're using um, sophisticated, sophisticated computing uh, capabilities is a lot higher than you, a poor you know, individual with no technology for the self. We have nothing, we have zip, right? If we, if we had the proper technology for the self, we would have access to all of that same information. That's, that's my theory. Um, so, uh, so it has several implications. Uh, one, one is, um, yes, uh, as I said, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the biggest fear is not the, the details that a given, uh, a given who-ness 
remembers. It's when all of the details, all of the who-nesses collaborate to recreate the self, and, and as you say, a, a Frankenstein self, because so, 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 so much detail. But, but um, our technology, our technology uh, in the past has not done a good job of, of, of separating contexts. So for example, everybody gives their, their email address to, uh, to everybody. And, and so all of that information can immediately be assembled um, across all of those who um, We can, uh, with the decentralized world and, and the proper use of pairwise keys, we can, we can provide recognition immediately without using a universal identifier like a like an email address and and therefore creating all of that um, uh, consolidation of information across the the who's so that's kind of uh, what I was trying to underline but uh, but I agree with you that um, there's also the question of of uh, you know this is this comes back to the uh, European Union's concept of the right to be forgotten or the requirement to delete information after certain periods of time and and all that. So a lot of this stuff it will be dealt with. If we don't have mechanisms technically to deal with it, it will be dealt with uh, through uh, legislation um, over time. Uh, Tim, two yeah. points. Uh, can I follow up? One on your point on legislation. <clears throat> I would say in general, legislation has proven to be the worst solution to the uh, worst process to define a solution to any problem I've seen in history, usually. So they come out and make a, uh, whatever the rule is, and then usually it's figured out from the consequences that it doesn't work. And it takes forever to slowly improve what the end result is. The other thing that you're bringing up on this whole identity space, talking about self and who-ness and all that other stuff, you talked about the, the, in a sense, the challenges over 25 years, if you will, of the world since the internet was born, trying to digitally model and, and find solutions to problems. And so 25 years ago, I was working in a different space and it really helped not to look at what I call technological solutions to anything. The right answer in my case, when I wanted to think about something was to step away from the technological world and step into the human world and where I have not 25 years of history or even whatever it was at the time, but really 12,000 years of history and really complex problems have already had good solution patterns developed in the human world, you know, in the social human world. And when I wanted to do something in the digital world, I took that problem in that context, moved it to what I call the human social world, then looked at how it was dealt in that space and said, oh look, you know, here's one or two or three great solutions that I can steal from and apply that approach to the digital world. And in every case, that led to huge, huge results compared to just trying to I'll put, incrementally move forward based on what I call the current digital solutions that have been built. You know what I mean? I, I'm literally- yeah. No, I, I'm with you uh, on I'm either that. stealing or borrowing, and I can see you're doing the same thing in the identity yeah. space. You That's what I'm, I'm calling for us to do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, because uh, just look how, how well uh, human, uh, how beautifully it works, you know, uh, in That's right. 12,000 years right. of evolution didn't yeah. go for waste, really. Was it only so. 12,000? I wonder if it went back before. Well, 500,000 <laughs> to a million. I, I, I just, uh, I totally right. agree different with scale. You. I, I, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> unless, you're, unless you believe uh, that humans came on Earth only about 12,000 years ago. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm talking about social systems. I love where this conversation is going. This is good. Hey, Kim, right. th this is this is Liam, um, and I got a quick question for you. And you don't have to. It's probably a little bit more loaded, so I won't expect a, an immediate answer. But and you know, sound initially a little crazy, but there's a, a reality to it actually. So I totally agree with your statements related to an entity or a person's individual, the the individual and entity or one to one relationship with single devices and you know, how we further changed to a state of an entity now being represented by multiple devices. But with that in mind, what are your thoughts related to our evolution to what I'm characterizing as multiple identities um, and multiple devices or a kind of a many to many representation of entities versus a many to one relationship? And to clarify that further, 
for example, outside the scope of mental cognition scenarios associated with like personality disorders and yada yada, there we definitely evolved, at least in my organization, a need to create multiple identities and thus the need to process data from entities represented by multiple entities where that data and individuals can I know this sounds a little holistic, but and maybe this applies to your holistic uh, digital identity, is where that data and the individuals can best be described as kind of in a superposition, um, the multi-state. And the logic behind some of these applies to IoT mesh environments, uh, some of our air efforts around competitive analysis, um, and how we're representing those personas, you know, through various entities, various devices, and processing um, kind of in a heterogeneous type configuration. So it's all the question goes back to the multiple or the one-to-one, -one, um, excuse me, the many-to-many -many relationship. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think you're completely right. The, it's, to me, it's not, uh, it's not, I mean, I believe that uh, when we use the word identities, you know, we're, that is, is really not the definition of identity that we've been talking about, right? So, right. Uh, and so that's what I call the recognition level. And, and to me, the recognition level should be pairwise, as it is, I think, when you think through the, the physical world thing, it's pairwise. It's between you sense the other and the other senses you. It's not, it's not, it's not a big universal identifier. It's a whole set of, right. of pairwise identifiers that then get, uh, somebody will come along and say, oh, that's the guy who, uh, you know, beat up so-and-so, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, exactly. And, so, and that's sort of a set of claims get, gets put on the, uh, the thing that has a recognition at a different layer. So I'm totally with you, and, the, and, the, and that's what enables this whole, uh, well, it enables both. That's products. what I was hoping you would say, <laughs> exactly, because yeah. I was afraid you were kind of doing that uh, kind of more one-to-one, -one, and so that actually helps, you know, now that helps well, clarify to me, your perspective. I, I now believe, yeah. I believe that we should just never have uh, universal identifiers at the recognition level, ever. It should totally, always I totally be agree. pairwise, and we should be uh, really, really serious and brutal about making sure that that happens. Okay, and then yep. that doesn't mean we can't have uh, things that are known about people that, that that transcend one of those identifiers. The, the the claims level is completely different level of reality as it is in the traditional model. So to go back to the yep. previous gentleman's concepts, yes, it's a matter of Let's, let's embrace the, uh, the world we come out of and, and civilize, okay, but in the sense of bringing our historical acquisitions to the internet. I totally agree. I like that perspective specifically because it really will even refute um, some of the original foundation for EMR, EHRs in the healthcare industry and so on. Um, and, you know, so when I look at that, yeah, when I look at the existing processes or systems versus what we're talking about here, is they all seem to be so antiquatedly ba based on what was known, you know, around paper systems or individual identity, like you were saying. So I like the fact that you answered it that way. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know what? You, you, I, I hope people will will uh, share their their thinking about this th that they have from uh, their own specific experiences like for example the healthcare and everything else I, I think that would be really wonderful and, and I, I would like to see a conversation um so, you know not necessarily in this group because this group has its own mandate but you know maybe we could just have some interaction on the web etc to sort of uh, make these ideas more more profound and, and flesh them out in in, in and show okay. as you count, just count did, me in what is <laughs> Okay, so, I'm counting that. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know what? Um, we can and we do uh, have, we have taken upon ourselves a wider mandate because, uh, I mean, we are identity working group inside Hyperledger, but we don't confine ourselves to just uh, the uh, Hyperledger um, platform. We go a little further so I, I can provide some space for that interaction or you can start it up on the inter, uh, on the emails and then we can uh, capture them in inside um, 
our systems. Uh, the other, uh, which is the wiki, uh, other uh, thing that I want to say is that we don't have to stop exactly at one o'clock. We can go on for a few more minutes because there's nothing else uh, sort of colliding with this, but it, it depends on people's appetite, uh, whether they want to continue to have a conversation at least for five minutes more uh, about all this. So, Bitman, I'll take you up on that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I knew that you would. <laughs> I can't shut up. I apologize. So, I'll <laughs> find that out shortly. I apologize for that. But I will say, Kim, one of the big takeaways I'll say is that we've always had this absolute view uh, in the digital world of anything. It's pretty much binary across everything. And one of the key things, go back to your look at Hunus, Hunus rather, as you defined it. And what you realize is, yes, you can define maybe a base an initial relationship of one en entity to another self, if you will, and call that Hunas. But the reality is, if you look at it um, fully, what you're going to realize is it's not absolute, it's relative. And that as additional information comes in, that Hunas relationship changes all the time. And none of, yeah. none of our systems I, I didn't I hope I didn't imply that it was uh, w that it was done once, but what no, what, I, what I wanted to imply was that the recognition was was done sort of at an unconscious level, and and that allowed precisely the uh, the the knowledge to be deepened over time. In other words, it created the glue between the different temporal mo moments when more and more information would be assembled. Right. Um, That's right. And so, the, the, in a sense, the, what that hunus, if you describe what the hunus is, the relationship of me to you, let's say, then the answer is, over time, that's going to change significantly as they realize, oh, wow, he's a better tennis player than I am. That's not something that was in our initial recognition sta stage, if you will. Right. That's why the, 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 um, the recognition is not the... Uh, is not the hunus. It's the means. That's why when I did hunus, I, I showed. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, here hunus. You see, it's got two layers. Right. The characteristics and the recognition. And the impression. I'll argue is that over uh, time those I keep continuing. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have put the impression, the distinct impression in the uh, bottom. Maybe that confused you. Um, no, but I, uh, just the fact that over time, in a sense, whatever the starting I, I point think, uh, is, Jim, I think that the characteristics uh, being uh, evolving over time is really the you know observed characteristics. Uh, I think that's that's what Jim was implying that it's already there, and that it's not a uh, static view. It's uh, just like the personal dynamic, uh, you know. Um, yeah, we have to do what we do in rea in in uh, physical reality. Okay, in physical reality, as you say, um, you're always adding um, and changing your view of the of the other. Um, yes. You know, and unless, so, Kim, unless you're unless there's something wrong with you, I mean, a lot of right. people get stuck and they don't recognize when others have changed. Right. Um, but well, I don't think we so, want to necessarily <laughs> replicate that part. <laughs> so if you look at this diagram, Kim, I would argue maybe there's another column here that could be added. So given that Hunus is not um, fixed, it's not a constant, it changes in the relationship you and I have, I would argue that therefore the value of that relationship to me might change. So I would say initially my recognition is, oh, he's an identity expert. But then as I realize you're a better tennis player than me, all of a sudden your value to me now has changed as well because your Hunus has changed, if that makes sense. So the value thing actually is a big thing because that's the outcome. That's the net result of these relationships is the potential value delivered from them, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because I tend to, especially in business, you know, working on business systems, you're always asking the question, well, what's the payoff? What's the value for this thing? Whether it's immediate or sustainable, whatever. But you're always, you're evaluating everything uh, against some sort of criteria to say, what's this worth? And I could say, yes, I now know he's a great tennis player too. So your value to me changes. See, well, uh, I think right, but, but they're individual. Really if, we, if we do some of this discussion in writing, because, uh, you know, in a public forum, because, uh, 
then we can actually hone it. You know, uh, that that's what happened when I wrote the laws of identity. I, I, I mean, uh, you know, I, I credit like about 40 people in the laws of identity who, who, who participated and, but, uh, you know, we should do the same thing. I, I, I yeah, I mean, so interesting. But, but just, but I'm, uh, I'm so glad that somebody cares about this because I was really afraid to even uh, give this uh, talk to because I thought, oh well, I'm, maybe <laughs> I actually cares. But it's 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 abstract, you know, it's it's high level. But you know, I don't. If we don't figure this out, we aren't going to actually solve the the real problems. You know, we're we're going to be bounded by our um, by what we happen to be doing. If you know what I mean. So, so, so I'm very yeah. I'm delighted, really. So, so I, I yeah, yeah, so I no, I this, think this is an interesting discussion. I had a different point, but I wanted to get back to this. You know, where we talk about these uh, individual identity attributes that have, as stated here, verified uh, credentials. You like my, um, if you look at a passport, my photo is a verified credential, and it does change over time. That's why. Um, issuing agencies put time limits on it for children. It's typically five years for adults. 10 years and that that covers the uh, that's one attribute that does change over time and you have to you know have a policy not a technology that says I need to update these ver verified credentials if you're a better de tennis player and you uh, make uh, a, you know get another championship well that's another verified credential anyhow my the, the only thing I wanted to introduce in the discussion is we're focused on human identity in, at least in um, ISO TC 307 um, identity, digital identity, identity is is a natural person, um, legal entity, thing or process, and I think we need to keep that in mind. Otherwise, um, you know, it will will break down because if we just focus on human identity, um, we need to focus on IoT and other uh, other. Yeah, I, I agree with I agree with that. And and if you read the laws of identity, it, it, it's based on the notion that identity is about subjects and the subjects can be all of those things. Okay, good. You know, the digital identity here though, I think, and I think that is fairly well uh, defined, you know, uh, the way that it, but the problem is once it, it's the part where that device gets associated with a person where things get weird because of the fact that, well, you know, uh, my cell phone, my my cell phone and and so it's almost and, and it's almost an extension of me and uh, there are a whole bunch of devices and and they are part of the self really uh, you, you know for e even the uh, I mean I mean not all things but say in a home automation system or all of, all of these things that have no security <laughs> you're looking at a point in time on evolution <laughs> on these devices. Yeah. Yeah. Where we're at today is just, it's not where I was with the, I'll call it the IBM PC in 1980. And so it won't be where I am in 20 years either. I, back in the early 90s, recognized this change in digital technology to the point that at the end, the end point is more of what I call DXH, a digitally extended human, where you don't have independent devices, they're just part of you. Exactly. But there are and also going to be yeah. independent devices, like uh, Dan was saying. Uh, sure, there's other devices the as well. Uh, independent in the sense that, you know, uh, some things that are on the street, let's say measuring uh, carbon emission, of course, they are going to be saying, okay, they are under the control of the city authority, but, you know, in a very loose way, it's not as, uh, the connection is not as uh, intense. So, I mean, just like in every other uh, sphere, there's a spectrum that goes from a close association like a cell phone to something that measures, uh, uh, you know, the out, the uh, chimney output of a power plant that measures the carbon uh, uh, coming out of there, or some other, uh, um, you know, devices that are in other other areas that, you know, like the the cameras that are put on the streets and observe people they have they are iot's and they have their own su supposedly identities so all of these you know it's 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 like a spectrum that goes from a human to these uh 
uh, you know, the, the TC307 definitions, which cover a, a lot more ground. And I suppose um, they all will have different rights and in, in the sense that, you know, well, corporations are people too, but uh, so, I'm talking about, uh, you know, a camera on the street, what, right. what so, rights do they have, right? So Kim, I'm gonna throw a problem back at you and just leave it with you because it's not gonna get answered. But the question is, who am I? So you talked about Hunas, you talked about self, and I'll throw it over the fence and say, okay, who am I? Because at a point with all of this technology, am I just me, the biological me, or as these what I call decentralized intelligent systems become part of me, which part of me are you having a relationship with? You know what I mean? So is the self just the biological self that I was born with, or is the self this larger entity? And if it is this larger entity, then the question is, which part of myself are you having a relationship with when you look at who-ness? Well, uh, and, I, th I, think it's, I think the self is all, all that of which I am conscious or can be conscious. The, and the problem has been conscious. Well, but just like blockchain, right? I started a long time ago. I was programming before Bill Gates. And the answer is today we have this, what I call a decentralized intelligence model on the blockchain. And we can have literally the same problem, if you will, um, when it comes to who a human self is. There's a point where we have about decentralized systems that have their own level of intelligence that are interacting on our behalf, right? Right. Whether it be Alexa or, you know, ring doorbell <clears throat> and whatever it is. <clears throat> so there's the model of who I am, but you're right. Ultimately, the question is, which part of me are you talking to or building that relationship with? So it, it's the who am I question, I guess, or who are you? It's question. very interesting. Uh, yeah, that's funny, problem. though. I don't know. Has there, I don't know if anybody has been following this. There's a group forming called TXR. Has anybody uh, followed that? No. No. TXR? TX off, T-X-A-U-T-H, anyway. And it, it starts with the proposition, the only reason I mention it is, it, it, it starts with the proposition that, uh, that you know, they're gonna work on authentication really, and, and the authentication standards really do need reworking. I mean, they're terrible. But um, they, they make the statement in their charter um, that uh, the, one of the things that is within their charter is the, um, delegation of identity now that really got me uh yes. going because the delegation of identity cannot be delegated Ident if you look at the definitions of identity as it's been used uh, over these twelve thousand years it is not something that it is the characteristics it is the who-ness it is the selfness and it can't be it can't be delegated what can be delegated is some kind of a capability so, uh, you know, I can delegate that to another identity, but I can't delegate the identity. That's my view. Um, anyway, and, and, yeah, you know, and yeah. it's so interesting because, you know, this is, it, to me, it was an example of why we need to, f to crisp up our language and, and cause people to hold on to these definitions that have been in use and, 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 and th that actually describe our humanness. Yeah, it's a great point. I think the, the only other thing to think about is this notion that things, and we all of us have mentioned it, that things change. So the entity that was me is not the same me as I was 10 years ago, whether it be my photograph going through TSA or the knowledge I have. But, but that's, but that, you know, actually, uh, 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 well, I, I will, there, there is a, a great quote in the OED's definition of identity. Um, and they're quoting from somebody, I don't know, Locke or one of the philosophers. Um, and, and, you know, people in those days were aware that your identity, even though all of the atoms, one of them says, you know, even though all of the atoms in your body change, right. um, you're still the same. Your, yourself does not change. And, and, and so really that, that is, is and has been um, understood for like four or 500 years, which is amazing. I mean, that, that amazed me. Okay. When I was, yeah. As in that you exist independently, so you exist independently of the specific manifestation of yourself. And so, I will say, a lot of people in the digital world fight what I call bringing in what you've been doing, which is applying what I call 
the understanding of the human world in a digital context. I cannot tell you how many digital architects and everybody else fight that. They go, no, no, it's not the way it is. Best example is a quarter century ago, we had a language called small talk that had the notion of self in it. Everything was a self. You could be a self, this object could be a self. Everything had the notion of self and a relationship. And the other thing it had was you didn't program it. You discussed it, just like you and I talk. I learned from you. You don't program me to learn about identity. You talk to me and I learn from you. And the whole model of that language was fundamentally different than other programming languages because you didn't teach. You had conversations, you collaborated, and you learned from experience, you learned from sharing information. And that was unlike regular programming. And I can remember having discussions with other developers saying, gee, I don't talk, to, I don't program the number seven. I actually can talk to it. It can tell me what it knows. And they're like, where are you, from Mars? And it's like, no, no, no. <laughs> Those models, they couldn't understand them because they weren't simple digital models. They were human models, but they actually worked in a digital world, which they just literally said, nope, it doesn't compute for them. And they just literally left it by the roadside as something I couldn't deal with. So it's interesting because we do have to I'll go back and say we have models for this in every case that have existed, as you point out, for 500 years, 12,000 or 500,000 years. <laughs> um, Jim, um, maybe we can ask somebody else if they have questions, and sure, uh, then we can uh, move on and we can continue this interaction if you want. Uh, uh, so I'm asking anyone else, they have anything for Kim? All right. I've exhausted everybody. No, no, no. It's <laughs> it's more the you know people don't want to. Uh, uh, no, I appreciate it uh, actually, but really, really appreciate the opportunity of of speaking with all of you folks, and you know hope that this that we can carry this on and uh, clean up our clean up our our concepts. Yeah, I think I think that's the key. Uh, we need to uh, really. Uh, continue this conversation, but also I like the fact that you went into some concrete uh, stuff in terms of the wholeness and the, because you do talk about uh, the, um, you know, specific uh, standards, YDC and CIOP and IDO2 and, you know, those kind of things. So some kind of a relationship to the abstract, to the concrete is, is uh, important. And, uh, you know, there are lots and lots of unanswered questions. So maybe uh, we can continue to interact. Um, maybe you can come back uh, after a while to give another talk, what, whatever, you know, whatever you want to do, that is, uh, we are open. And uh, we also would like to make a, a line to the uh, Hyperledger frameworks uh, that we have, and I know that you mentioned Aries. Uh, it was incubated uh, here. We are the, you know, kind of a launch pad for a lot of, uh, for Indy, for Aries, uh, for other identity related topics here. So we are very broad in our thinking, but also we can be very focused on specific topics. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we'll speak soon. Shall I uh, end the meeting much. then? Thank huh? you. Thank you very much. It was extraordinary. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, that was awesome. I second that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. This is like that chipmunks thing where they keep bowing to each other. That's right. I just got back from Japan. <laughs> And I looked out the window as the plane was uh, was taking off, and you know those little guy, those guys who are out on the tarmac with the little lights in each hand, you know, for, they yes. as as the car as the plane took off, they both bowed to us, the way they do when you leave a uh, a restaurant or something like that. I I was so touched. <laughs> anyway. Uh, I, I love the fact that they appreciate each other, you know, and they yep. show it. So I appreciate you guys. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. I bow down to you. <laughs>
a bowathon. That's what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Bye bye. Bye.